Good morning, unless it's not. So many games are coming out recently that maybe I should take a break from talking about them and actually play them. There's only one problem though. What are these? Video games would be nothing without the controllers. Just one more minute, guys. Back in the day, these controllers were basically made to control the games, but now controllers tend to be standardized. Aside from a few games, usually Rock Band related, games just use the controllers that were already made for the system. This means that the developers have to modify their game to be controllable by whatever controller is on the market. Luckily enough, modern controllers for the most part are the same. Four face buttons, a D-pad, two analog sticks, a couple of shoulder buttons here and there, and the special ones. What is a three lines? Sometimes when you're playing a game, the controls just work. Everything fits together really well, and it does a lot to enhance the experience. After all, the less I have to think about buttons, the more likely I am to get lost in a game. Games like Risk of Rain or Smite tend to have this effect for me, but I keybound those, so it's not really the same. Today, I want to talk about the control schemes that just fade away from your conscious, so that I can then compare them to the ones that don't. It's hard for me to look through my history of gaming and pick one that really stands out for me because, I mean, a really good control scheme is just like me. It's better if you don't know it's there. One button games like what you might find on a mobile game or those old mouse-based computer games, those kind of fit into this category. I mean, it is pretty hard to mess up clicking on something. But can we really consider those good controls? They're barely even controls. I doubt the developers really even thought about them. It's not like you really have to put effort into click on thing. And as much as I'd love to consider Facebook a game, I'd hate to know what my life would be like if that were true. Good morning! It's not. It's never a good morning. Welcome back to Facebook reviews. You know thumbs? I try to remember. They were just a match made in heaven for video games. I mean, everyone has them, except for people who don't, and video game companies want everybody to buy them, except the ones who don't have thumbs. They're exactly the same. Add a couple of buttons, some moving sticks, it's ADHD's worst nightmare. Move over, Oreo. Thumbs have a new favorite cookie. Why does it always come back to Oreo? Of course, not every controller comes exactly the same way. Companies have to keep their controllers different for some reason. People have their own preferences when it comes to these things, so there's no right answer. But there are loads of wrong ones! So many companies tried their hand in video games when they were just starting to realize how much money they could make. I mean, even looking at the major companies, their controllers didn't stay the same forever. True, Xbox and PlayStation have had very similar controllers their whole lives, while Nintendo was busy having... recurring strokes? What the hell? Nintendo controllers have always morphed a little bit, trying to better capture the gaming experiences they were looking to make. Even their worst controller, the N64 one, doesn't come close to being the worst, though. I mean, look at the Atari controller. This thing is way too small and only has one button. I don't know whether to use a finger or a thumb, and oh my god, just be glad nobody made one to look like a TV remote. Ah! So right off the bat, controls are hard to get right. Back in those days, most controllers were actually made with the games in mind. Especially because a lot of these consoles packed in the controllers with the games, or the games with their consoles. But even now, it's not like it's easy to make a game with controls in mind. The Xbox controller is massive compared to the Switch Joy-Cons. They all have an X button in a different spot, the triggers are radically different for each, and PC exists. A lot of people like to discuss whether PC gaming is better than console gaming, and my answer to that is, who cares? Sure, PC has its benefits, console has its benefits. I'm a creator, I needed a computer, and I'm a nerd, so you know I'm gonna buy every console Nintendo will ever sell me. But long gone are the days where consoles were made with their controllers and the games for them in mind. Which means now developers have a lot more to chew on, trying to make sure that the game works for the consoles and the PC at the same time. It doesn't always work. It isn't very often that trying to develop a game for multiple consoles really does much. As I mentioned, most consoles have a pretty similar setup for their controllers. And then you remember the Wii existed. Nintendo doesn't play games the same way as everyone else. We would like to play. They just show up at your house like, here's Mario. And that was especially true of the Wii era. Nintendo was already heading down a different path with the GameCube. 
they started playing around with portable consoles and weird connectors, and all of that went even further when the Wii came out. I mean, look at this thing. It looks like something you'd want to hide when someone enters the room. Joke's on you. I hid mine forever ago, and by hid, I mean lost. So while game developers would have to change their games if they wanted to release them on the Wii, a lot of games were still releasing on all three major consoles at the time. Which meant for every chicken shoot, you also had a chicken shoot. Motion controls were a big thing for the Wii. It was the main draw, and Wii Sports would never let you forget that. It won't leave. And while Nintendo made sense doing wacky shit, it was their brand, why did Call of Duty have to do the same thing? I'll give you a hint. The answer is money. The Wii was a commercial gold mine. Everybody had one of these in their house, and if you wanted to make as much money as possible, your game had to release on this system. So that meant we were stuck with this, and oh my god is it so slow. See, shooters tend to want you to, you know, shoot things. And those things are usually shooting at you. You don't have time to aim with this stupid controller, and there was no sh stick for the camera, so you had to move that with the Wiimote too. It just doesn't work. Good thing Nintendo never made a game like this. You've got to be kidding me. Metroid Prime is a franchise I avoided for far longer than my contract allows. I've tried finding loopholes. And while the games work fine for their control schemes, I also just lied. What are these controls? Metroid Prime 3 on the Wii used the same kind of point where you want to shoot controls as the Call of Duty games. Same with the remastered trilogy. But this is a first-person exploration game where you have to turn the camera by aiming at the side of the screen. This is awful! You'd have to be some sort of nerdy game nut in order to play through these games. Hello! But what's even worse is the GameCube versions. So you can't aim and walk at the same time. Whatever, the game is kind of built around it. But you also can't really walk anyway, because Samus has tank movement! Up and down, move her forward and back, but left and right, turn left and right. So you can't really sidestep unless you're locked onto something. And if you want to freely aim, you have to stand in place while you hold the R button in order to aim around your field of view. The only benefit of this control scheme is that I have something to tell at Scary Stories. And if you want to shoot, you press the A button. Oh no, please stop. Funnily enough, the Metroid franchise is one of the main reasons I wanted to complain about video game controls. And probably the main reason Nintendo hasn't funded Metroid Prime 4 by now. The developers haven't even beaten the first three yet. But the Prime franchise has a lesser known side game, and of course the best system to put this on is the Nintendo DS, a system synonymous with shooter titles that also had Call of Duty and other shooters, why? Prime Hunters on the DS moves a lot of stuff to the touch screen, which alleviates some of the issues, because the only thing any of the face buttons do is jump, and since it doesn't matter which one you press, you can just kind of leave your hand wherever is best to hit a button. You know it's gotta be Nintendo when the handheld spin-off has better controls than the main series. Besides, I always loved playing download play with my friends and crushing them in multiplayer because they didn't own the game themselves. <sighs> and somehow that isn't even the last Metroid game with terrible controls. You may remember from my in-depth look at 2D Metroid, but I hate the controls for Super Metroid. I'm genuinely surprised there hasn't been a remake yet, because it would help so much on that front. It's not the worst, sure, but it's really frustrating having to cycle between a bunch of weapons mid-battle by pressing select. Most times I tried to avoid switching weapons, because if I had to on the fly, I'd end up with the wrong thing. That's not what I wanted. By now you may have realized that Nintendo consoles seem to have the biggest chance of messing up controls. It makes sense. I mean, most games are developed for certain control styles, and every game on these consoles had to use some stupid touch or motion gimmick. During this era, it became nearly impossible to just have a regular Nintendo game, even. Zelda had motion control swords on the Wii and full touch control movement on the DS, and when Zelda screws up, you know it's too late. Zelda's one of those franchises that I think has outgrown the scope of just being a Nintendo fan. It really draws in a lot of people. And now that I've got all you Zelda fans here, Zelda controls suck ass! Zelda is an amazing franchise. It fits what it wants to do so perfectly. It's an adventure. As the hero, you have to find all the tools that will help you defeat evil. But Link only has two hands and an endless amount of pocket space. Back in the series' roots, there were also a lot fewer buttons. 
It really makes me wish there were modern versions of these two, because as it stands, you have to open up your inventory and swap items every single time you don't have the right one equipped, and you probably don't have the right one equipped. Well, that was a very specific puzzle. I hope I don't get attacked. I think this is a bit better on newer versions, but inventory management has always been a bit of an issue for me. I'm a hoarder, so I tend to have too many things, and it's hard to sort through the 50 slots I have to find the one small PNG I'm looking for. The PS2 has a lot of familiar memories for me, but also a lot of these problems the more I think about it. Ratchet & Clank, a franchise known for its many wacky guns, has you slow down time to choose a new one. And most of these games only allow 8 different items on the quick select wheel to begin with. So I have to dig through my menus, find the gadget I need for one puzzle, use it, and then go back to blasting. GTA games had a similar issue, but at least managed to condense it down a bit. Jack and Daxter had an interesting solution, where you had three weapons set to each d-pad direction, but that still meant cycling through three similar weapons every time. But you know me, I can complain about anything! So are there any games out there that have perfect controls and there's no way I could complain about them at all? No. But I do think there are some that get a little close. Mario Odyssey is one of my favorite games to this day, and I may be in the minority there, but I remember just having a blast with this game. I wasn't a Mario fan before it. Mario feels so great to control, even with his wide variety of moves, you never really get confused as to which one you're trying to use. And there are a lot of enemies, but each one only has one or two controls to keep things as simple and quick as possible. Of course, they didn't want to be perfect, so they added in these strange motion control hat tosses that I can't seem to get working correctly every single time. There weren't enough buttons for these, but they also weren't super important, so I just kind of ignore them. And being able to ignore them is the point! I shouldn't have to dwell on the controls in my game, they should just feel like instinct. And platformers get this down so well that I feel like I should make a terrible segue, Spyro 2. Spyro the Dragon is one of those franchises I feel like everybody knows, but have you ever seen a video about the controls? Of course not, they're perfect, nothing else to say. Run, jump, breathe, fire, glide. It's something everybody is born knowing how to do. Excuse me. But Spyro 2 added a lot more to do, especially with loads of power-ups, but every single thing feels super intuitive. And if there's ever a section that doesn't, it's probably the ice. But ice doesn't count. It never even went to college. One of the biggest problems with talking about good video game controls is that there shouldn't be much to say. It's a lot easier to describe how something doesn't work than how it does. Like, what do you want me to say? I turned right, which is so unfair. Our brains are so wired to hate things that we can't really notice good things unless they stand out. Honestly, I think there's only one game that I've ever heard anybody compliment the controls of specifically. Super Mario 64. I'm a hipster, it's one of the facts of life, which means 64 just can't be my favorite Mario game. Or maybe growing up I never played it and wasn't that into platformers until more recently. But one of the things that comes up every single time someone is talking about this game is the controls. The freedom, the response, the tight yet fluid movement. The game and the controller were made hand in hand. Miyamoto wanted to make sure that playing this game felt as natural as breathing. And considering we're still talking about it, he must have done something right. It's something I'd really like to see more of. It's so hard to get right. But if those basic controls feel really fun, then everything that's built on top of that is just a joy to experience. You can start throwing in interesting and exciting stuff all you want, but considering how often you run and jump in these games, if they don't feel right, you're bound to notice eventually. And once you do, you'll start blaming the controls if the game doesn't go right. Which inversely means that Mario 64 is a terrible game because I can't blame the controls when I die. So controls are important. So important that you never really want to notice they're there. I still have no idea what these are.